Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like uh, Mr. Bell said, my name is Tim Webster. I know I've worked with uh, many of you before. Um, but yeah, we're going to cover some advanced uh, DE4000 configuration. Um, I'm going to spend uh, a bit of time uh, today on kind of introducing everyone to some of the new features that you will be seeing in the 3.0. Uh, and then um, uh, Brian Worth is also here. Um, he may have some stuff to add as well as we go through this. Um, all right, let me share my screen for everyone. And let me know when you guys can see it. Yep, it's uh, good to go, Tim. All right. OK, so um, again, we'll, we're going to have a 3.0 release coming out here shortly. Um, there's some minor bug fixes, some minor feature um, implementation. And then the big major focus of the 3.0 is going to be the addition of the uh, bootloader into the 4000 to allow for firmware updates. Uh, without using uh, the ST link cabling uh, like we've used in the past uh, and will allow you to do the updates uh, through the user interface uh, with a file that's simply placed on a USB thumb drive and attached to the DE4000 control board. Um, so I guess first off, let me just uh, show you um, two minor feature additions, uh, super simple ones. Um, they do require some scripting, and I'll explain some of the scripting um, to utilize them. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the big asks has been um, some more options as far as um, the dashboard elements and visually how they look. And oh, uh, prior to the 3.0, we have implemented uh, background color changes in, on certain uh, elements. So um, as you guys can see here, I have a uh, several different colors on these LEDs on this dashboard. Um, and those are implemented uh, typically uh, through the name, the label. Um, you can use both uh, uh, simple names like uh, green, yellow, slate, gray, blue. Uh, but you can also get go as complex as you want because um, it'll understand HTML uh, color codes. So you could go to a simple website like uh, like this w3school.com. They have an HTML color picker. Uh, you can pick a color that you want, whatever sh shades you want, and then it gives you this uh, hash that you can put in uh, in the label and change that color. So that's those are the background colors uh, of that. But one of the things that has been requested is additional colors on the active LEDs. And so I've been able to implement those. Uh, I've got this just with some script linked to this input channel. Uh, when I get above 50, uh, you'll see that the color standard color is green. Uh, we also have a yellow. And then when I get above 100, we have a red. So uh, there is an, uh, what I'm calling an amber, which is more of a orangish yellow, um, which is similar to the yellow that you guys have been familiar with on the radial gauges when you have alarm set points. Uh, I don't have one set up here real quick, but it, it's essentially just a slightly orange yellow versus the, uh, the bright yellow that we see here. So that has been implemented again, just a minor implementation there. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, addition um, that has been requested uh, is uh, to show alarms right here on the uh, on the bottom dashboard. Um, we will be eventually adding this in um, your existing uh, input channels with your alarm settings um, do show up in the event log here. But 
what, I, what I'm going to display today, this is more custom alarms when you get into some of the scripting that has been done and you just have posted alarms and we've used it in several applications. And I know anyone out there that's done any of their own scripting, um, you just put a an LED or some kind of indicator that would toggle when it when it would alarm. But now we can also uh, place an alarm in the uh, bottom status LCD. Uh, again, that doesn't currently show up in events. This is just a custom alarm, but we will uh, get that implemented where it will toggle into there as well. <clears throat> so those are two of the minor updates that we've done. Um, but let me uh, let me show you guys the major implementation. Uh, which is the uh, the bootloader. So um, in the future, um, when you uh, get a firmware update, in uh, in the past we uh, provided uh, SREC files. Um, you guys have seen those if you've done any of the ST links in the past. You'd have to connect the ST link programmer to the board connect to it, pick that SREC file, and it would load into the board. Um, as we move forward, um, you're going to get a uh, real uh, a single file. And that single file is going to be a, a file uh, just labeled bootloader with the revision number. Uh, and it's a dot ATF, similar to the update ATF that you used in the past with the micro US uh, micro SD card. Uh, but this single file is all encompassing. It has the for that that firmware release. It'll have the controller firmware, the terminal board firmware and the web app um, update ATF file as well, all packaged in, into one that you can place on a uh, USB thumb drive. So the uh, interface is ac accessible through the system information, uh, and that's down here with the gear when you pull up to load your config or change your passwords. It'll have a uh, system information. And this screen is the new screen. Uh, it has the same information. Um, it has version numbers and uh, you know what's currently in there. And bear with me just a second. I was uh, testing something right before this, and that's why that's not showing up. But give it a moment. Um, so this screen will pop up uh, when you first. Uh, if you pull this screen up and you don't have the USB connected, uh, what's going to happen is it tries to refresh from the uh, device. Just a moment. I have to refresh it. All right, so it's gonna it's gonna try to refresh, and if the device is not connected, it's gonna come up and say, "Please connect the device," and then press the refresh button. While it's actively going out and looking at the uh, files on the, your USB drive, um, this button will be inactive, uh, just like this uh, proceed to update button and the firmware buttons here on the side. So you can see here now it's refreshing the USB, uh, the file list from the USB device.
And once that's done, it comes up and tells you to uh, select uh, a module above to see wh what firmware is available. So here you can see the firmwares um, for the boards and the web app. Um, you can select uh, however many, and you can you can keep one USB drive. You can throw as many files on there as you get new releases. It'll scan through all of the available files and and find and build this master list of everything. Um, now there's some protections built into the system where this proceed to update will not operate if you uh, don't meet all of these conditions listed here. So if if you are currently not logged in as admin uh, or uh, it senses a speed input uh, or if you're not in state zero. So you do have to shut down the unit that you're working on, uh, which you had to do in the past, uh, but we wanna make sure the unit's shut down. We're re not reading any RPM and we are uh, logged in either in the factory mode or in admin mode. So the general user and view only will not have access to this. So once you meet all those conditions and you guys can see, like give it some RPM, you guys see that that X goes on there and it will not let me proceed. Um, once I clear the RPM and meet all these conditions, then I can safely proceed. So once you've selected a board uh, and selected what version of firmware that you want, you'll hit the proceed to update. It gives you another confirmation to verify that you are, this is the board you're gonna update. This is the firmware that you're doing. Um, you know, it talks about, you know, making sure you know, everything's there. Uh, we do recommend that you back up the configuration. Uh, and again, that's something you guys have done before where you put a uh, name in here and hit export and you can export out the current configuration. <clears throat> so you've got a file selected, you've verified, uh, the board and the file that you're going to use, and then you hit proceed. There's an additional warning here, um, talking about the safety and and you know making sure that everything's good to go, and then you can hit the begin update. Um, what happens when you do that? And I won't let you guys sit through all that. You'll get a, st a status bar um, as it's going through the update. Uh, the one thing that you guys will see when you when it's doing the update um this status led on the control board uh i'll just play this for you guys it's a normal heartbeat when everything's uh operating normally so there's the normal heartbeat at the beginning once it gets to the part where it sends the file to the board you're going to see a different sequence here it's going to it's going to be out for uh couple seconds as it goes into bootloader, then it goes to a rapid heartbeat. That means it's actively in bootloader and it's receiving the file from the user interface. Once it finishes loading and confirms that it loaded successfully, it will re reboot the board and then it'll force a soft reset of all the other boards so that we can reinitialize the connection between all of uh, the individual terminal boards and the control board. Um, so here you can see in this video, it's going through the rapid, it's doing the test, and now it does its final reboot and you'll get back to the steady heartbeat that you're familiar with. Uh, you'll see something similar on the uh, terminal board, except it's up here near the power plus. It doesn't have status on the label, but it is up near the power connector. Same thing, heartbeat connector. Uh, what it's what it's gonna do, uh, instead of blinking rapidly green, it actually blinks red. Uh, and your uh, hardware safety uh, light will come on solid during the upload. So right here, the
configuration, does a validation, then resets the power and forces all the other connected boards to do a soft reset uh, to reestablish connection between all the boards. I'll give this a second. You guys can see it when it uh, finishes. It goes solid there for a moment, and then both of these should kick out. And then this this light here, when it's done, uh, will uh, will go back to the green, uh, steady, slow, rhythmic beat. So there, that's what you'll see. Uh, once that's finished, um, again, it'll have a pop up here with the status bar zero through 100. Once it's finished, it goes to 100. You'll get a success message. Um, once you hit that, then it'll refresh the version that you currently have here. Um, the only difference is going to be the web app. It actually forces a reload of this page. Um, whether it's on your laptop or on the HMI, it will force a refresh to load the new web application in that just got updated. So, so that procedure is going to be uh, in our uh, documentation wiki. Um, so we will include that in there uh, when the official release comes out with the whole procedure. Uh, we'll also have a uh, procedure, you know, uh, explaining how to load the files onto the USB drive, but it is real simple. Uh, as long as you don't don't rename the files or anything that we present to you, you just uh, put that in the uh, root directory of the uh, of the USB drive. Okay. Um, Brian, do you want to go through um, some of the scripting? I think we, I think we lost Brian there. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, earlier I had shown you those simple uh, updates that we've included in the 3.0. Um, to get this multicolored LED, um, it does. It it is just for um, the uh, virtual channels. So anyone that's done any scripting uh, on the D D4000 is familiar with uh, the function set svert. You guys understand how to do that. Um, the difference here is uh, we've incorporated uh, both the value and the color code uh, into the svert um, specifically to uh, utilize this in a, the uh, LED set up on the dashboard. So this is uh, this is the example for this presentation. I'm getting my channel value for one of my inputs and then a simple if else if statement to set my three parameters. So if it's less than 50, I'm going to set the value here. Uh, if it's uh, for between 50 and 100, I'm going to set the value to here and then everything else would be here. And the way that we do this, the LED element already understands the uh, string of a zero or a one. So if you set it to zero, it's going to uh, turn off that LED. You set it to one, it's going to turn on that LED. If we didn't, if we don't have anything else past it, it was just a one, it would be our standard green LED that you guys are familiar with. Uh, but if you put in parentheses the background color and the LED color separated by a comma, um, 
and a single single letter for the LED color, G for green, Y for yellow, R for red, and A for amber. Um, then that'll just set it. So you can see there, it's very, it's very flexible within your configuration, uh, within your scripting that you can control when you want the LED to be on, when you want it to be on, what color. And as you guys have seen in this example, um, it will change in real time as it meets those conditions. So now right now those four colors, uh, the four colors for the LED uh, are the only ones available. Uh, we could potentially add more. Um, so we're always, you know, willing to accept feedback. It's uh, simple enough now that that uh, code has been in there that we could uh, add additional items to the list. Um, the background color, like I said, uses those HTML hex um, values. Uh, so that pretty much all those colors are available because of the uh, the way that it processes those codes and builds uh, builds the actual actual colors for the backgrounds. Okay. Um, so the the custom alarm that I showed you earlier, uh, I just linked that off of my third channel here. So this custom alarm, uh, just like we've done in the past where we had an alarm that was just a SVIRT that we would just set it to one when we were in alarm. Um, we can essentially do the same thing here, except we're using uh, the uh, the status string. So if you put any value in the status string, it will override whatever's down here. And we've used this, in, um, and some, some uh, customers have utilized this uh, during startups to do some special messages. Uh, typically, you would see the blue startup uh, it would be a blue background. It would give you your startup stuff. Uh, a good example is like a, a manual purge. Um, you may see a special message here and a pop up that comes up saying, hey, go, you know, go open this valve or close this valve or, or whatever. And, you know, it just sits there and waits for the operator to come back and hit OK. And then it moves on from that state. But that's done with this status string. It overrides any of the standard configurations. So as long as you start your string with the word alarm, uh, it will kick out uh, with a background color of yellow. So you could do a whole series of alarms. Uh, the only thing that you need to be aware of is <clears throat> once you set the status string, you need to unset it to clear it so that the other messages can come up, um, whether it's the normal start where it shows us what state you're in as you're going through the start sequence or anything like that. So you need to have a, uh, a line that actually clears it and puts an empty string into um, that SVIRT so that it clears. And that's essentially what I did here. If I'm greater than 20 on my channel, my status string becomes this uh, standard alarm, test alarm. And then if I drop down below, it clears it and whatever was on there previously will show. So if it was up and running and it shows the green running uh, and then we kick into an alarm, uh, once the alarm clears, we, we clear that status string and it'll go back to the running message. So whatever the previous message was, it'll, it'll stay in that state. Will it, will a shutdown input override that message if, it was in that alarm state when a fault came in? Uh, that is a good question. I haven't tested that, um, but I, I, I will confirm that uh, before the release and I'll just make sure that uh, that we clear that status okay. string. I, I think it does. The best thing to do 
that case, best thing to do in that case would be to wrap the in, um, the code that, that you have there now that says if it's greater than 20, then set the alarm. Otherwise, set it blank. If you wrap that in a section that that says if if state is uh, then zero, um, then run that code. Otherwise, set it back to blank. So that yeah. way, if if it if it goes to a shutdown or or something other than the running state, uh, it'll make sure that that's blank. Yeah, so essentially you'd do something like this. You'd wrap that whole thing. So Yeah, so essentially, if we're not in state zero, it's going to let this code run. And then if we are in state zero, it's always going to default to status string blank. So that'll clear it. So if you go into a fault, the system will go into state zero, it'll shut down, it'll clear any alarms you had, and, and that will allow the uh, um, the shutdown fault message to, to be displayed. Good, good question, though. All right. Um, Brian, do you have uh, any additional um, updates that you wanted to present? So I just wanted to um, mention some of the things that that will be uh, upcoming um, with the DE4000 in, in conjunction with um, our support for uh, controlling and, and displaying the status of other external devices uh, using our Altronic uh, web interface solution. Um, so so we're preparing a uh, implementation that will allow us to present the DE4000 interface, but also uh, some tabs that would allow you to bring up a full screen view of the external devices. Uh, so it could be any any number of our legacy devices or, or our new devices like the uh, AFR500 or the NGI5000 uh, displayed on a uh, through, through our Altronic web interface and then be able to basically tap back to the uh, DE4000. So it's a little bit different than than the way that we currently map those to uh, dashboard entries on the DE4000 screen. Um, and instead, it's a it's a full interface for those other devices, uh, but they share the same screen as the uh, DE4000. So um, I don't have anything to, to show on that, but just a, a heads up that coming and should be covered in, uh, in more detail in, in uh, either of the two upcoming sessions at the end of this month or the middle of, uh, of August. So we'll, we'll definitely have more to uh, more to share there. Um, now, is, that's is really that... all that I have unless there's questions. I just wanted to, for my own understanding because I haven't been directly involved in that, Brian. Um, is that going to be inside of this dashboard as an additional dashboard? You'll have that uh, that full screen, but you'll still have access to the uh, the the main uh, interface of the four thousand.
We may have lost Brian again. Yep. That's hey, that's hey, Tim, that's my this is Greg. Yeah, Greg. Hey Tim, um, you might explain um, how the bootloader works at what um, version. When can we um, be able to use the USB at what uh, so software um, firmware? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, good question, Greg. Um, so, uh, we will be releasing a uh, version 3.0.0, and at that point, anything 3.0.0 or greater will have the bootloader implemented into it. So, the when that release comes out, it will be. Um, you'll still have to use the ST link to load it in. It's it's going to be an SREC file, but we're using a different extension to uh, denote that it has the bootloader. Um, so when you guys see that release and we provide that to you, um, uh, instead of having the .srec extension, it's going to have an uh, .s19, which is an SREC. It's the exact same format, but that's our, our quick and easy way to, to tell that 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 newer file um, provides you the bootloader code as well as the application code that gets loaded into the into the board. Um, from that point on, once you've initialized that the first time and you've it's got that bootloader code in it, then we're going to provide those bootloader.atf files um, for subsequent releases. So and and that'll allow us to provide. Um, more rapid minor releases as as we make minor adjustments and then also the major releases so um again we're looking at you know the 3.0.0 and then we may do 3.0.1 would be a minor release where 3.1.0 may be a a, ne a next major milestone and then obviously big big milestones will go from 3.0 to 4.0 and and such on so, you know, once we have that bootloader 3.0 and above, um, it should be quick and easy to implement new features uh, onto the system. Um, uh, one of the other features um, that we've added um, that has been greatly requested um, is when we do the web application update that we don't purge the existing configuration. <clears throat> so, if you go to a unit that's been in the field, it has a specific application with specific dashboard setups and everything. Um, we're not going to clear that out like we have in the past. So um, now there'll be a mechanism that will allow you to purge a unit um, just on the off chance that you need to wipe wipe out a unit and, and have the standard blank configuration that you guys are familiar with. Uh, when we've done the update ATF on the micro USB or micro uh, SD. Um, so we'll have a mechanism that will let you do that. Um, but the standard as you update the individual uh, firmware versions, we're not going to force you to wipe out and have to reload your configuration every single time. All right. Um, I guess I'll open it up for questions. Folks, any questions for Tim? Tim, the review is yeah, excellent team. here. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Go go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, Tim, uh, Brian, uh, just recently we are doing an implementation of the D4000 here in Latin America with customers that they used to have D3000s and D3000 pluses and some and even all technology, 2500s and things like that. Some of those customers, uh, they they like to bring all the information using their SCADA system. And what we've done in the past is using the Modbus address list to bring the information and, and the status of the channels, timers, etc. cetera. Uh, when we start doing this D4000, uh, we could do some of them. Uh, we figured out that some other Modbus registers we uh, haven't been created yet, so we have to make that process on, into the script, and we did it. But there were some others that were not possible 
since and my understanding some tags were not created into the into the main program and and things like that so basically just doing a resume it looks like some of the previous features or not features the information that can be achieved from D3000, D3000 pluses are already into the D4000. Is that something that we can have in the future? Do you have that on the pending hey, lease? Hey, John. Am I wrong or right? John, this is Matt Trena. Can you give me an example of one thing that's not in there? Yeah, for example, that we might try help us to clear it up. Yeah, we try to we try to see the timer's status, and it was not possible. We cannot create that scripting because those those tags were not created. The timer status is that what you said? Yes, sir. The timer, the A time, the timer class A, class B, class C, what are the status? Those those kind of things were not possible. That's the first I've heard that, and maybe I don't know, Tim, if you want to comment, but we can definitely add that to uh, to the feature request list to get that implemented. But up, up until that, this point, I've not heard that, so that's good information, John. If that's truly the case, no, okay. we, no we can access the we can access the uh, the time remaining on the on the class B timers, and we can expose that on a uh, Modbus register. I I believe it's already in one of the standard standard registers, but if not, we can definitely uh, just do that with a single line of, of Modbus script. So if you want to um, send an email to uh, Tim Webster and, and Brian Worth, will will give you the support you need on that. Thank you, gentlemen, no problem. We will do it. Thank you. Hey, John. One additional note, I would say if you had the list of the, I don't know, top five or ten things, if there were that many, um, instead of like one or two, you know, like and then having an email, um, just if you had that list, just shoot it over and then uh, we'll get you the support you need to get those added. But I, I didn't think there was anything inside the system that could actually not be accessed. So maybe there is, maybe we're missing one or two of those. But if you just shoot that list of, of you know, what you tried to do and couldn't, and we'll uh, we'll get that taken care of. Thank you, Matt. We will do it. Thank you so much for the support. Thanks, John. Good question. Any other questions? So, does the DE four thousand have to be of a certain update status to move to the three point oh? Like if it's a an O two point Oh, does it have to go to 2.1 then um, to 3.0 or, or? Great question. Um, I've tested all the way from 2.0 up going straight to 3.0 and uh, not had any issues. Um, we did have that in the past when you went from the pre 2.0 to 2.0 or 2.1 you always had to stop and do the 2.0 update and the primary reason for that was the uh the kernel update on the SOM module uh it required that update which was only part of the 2.0 uh update so but between 2.0 and the the soon to be released 3.0 uh you can go straight to that um, so obviously, if if you've got a system out there that is pre 2.0, uh, you will need to do the 2.0 update first, and then you can go up to the 3.0. But good question. 